Well, good afternoon. I hope you all had a good restorative lunch and perhaps a walk through the galleries again to refresh yourselves and refresh your eyes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeannie Kenmotsu. I am the Japan Foundation Assistant Curator of Japanese Art at the Portland Art Museum. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the esteemed speakers who will comprise our afternoon program. Uh, just to give you a rundown on the afternoon, we will have two speakers followed by a short break at about four when you're welcome to stretch your legs and then comments from our two discussants. Uh, and then uh, Chini Coles has agreed to say a few words at the end of the day. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our two speakers and our two discussants now so that we can transition smoothly later on. I have a few more remarks um, uh, to say, uh, in part because I can't just tell you that I've known them for 40 years and um, we've worked together that whole time. Um, the first of our speakers this afternoon is Dr. Paul Berry who formerly taught Japanese art history at the University of Washington and later at Kansai Gaidai University in Kyoto. Dr. Berry focused on the selection of literati paintings for this exhibition and the forthcoming catalog, but he has also been an important advisor to the collection's formation more broadly. His own research interests range from literati painting to modern painting, and he is currently at work on a book on Japanese painting during the first half of the Showa period, 1926 to 1955, with emphasis on the response of painters to wartime circumstances and the immediate aftermath. We deeply regret that Dr. Barry was prevented from tra traveling to be here with us today. However, he has prepared a video presentation of his talk, and we are, feel very fortunate that he can still be part of the gathering here today presenting in absentia. The next of our speakers this afternoon is Dr. Michio Morioka, an independent scholar based in the Seattle area and an expert in modern Nihonga, or traditional Japanese style, or traditional style Japanese painting. Dr. Morioka selected the modern works for the exhibition, but she is also deeply knowledgeable about the Coles collection as a whole, having assisted Chini and Mary Coles with research and documentation of the collection for many years. I learned a great deal reading Dr. Morioka's entries for the forthcoming publication, and I am delighted that she will speak today about a dramatic ink painting by Kondo Koichiro. After Dr. Morioka's presentation, we'll have a short break and then resume with comments from two scholars who have flown in from Japan for this occasion. Masatomo Kawai will offer his thoughts on poetic imagination from the perspective of an expert in the field of ink painting. Professor Kawai retired as a professor of Japanese art history from Keio University in Tokyo, and he is now the director of the Chiba City Museum of Art. His scholarship has spanned many, many periods and genres of Japanese art, influencing a generation of young scholars like myself with his wide-ranging and deeply thoughtful publications. We are doubly grateful for Professor Kawai's presence with us here today because he is also a generous colleague who has worked closely with scholars, curators, collectors, and students in North America and Europe for decades. Next, Shinobu Ikeda, professor in the Department of History at Chiba University, will offer her perspective on poetic imagination as a specialist in Yamato-e. This is a category of Japanese painting which emphasizes native themes, narratives, and uses a distinctly polychrome palette in contradistinction to modes of Japanese ink painting. Professor Ikeda is also a wide-ranging scholar of Japanese art history. In addition to important studies on gender and Japanese art, Professor Ikeda's publications and current projects reflect her research interests in narrative painting, gender studies, and questions of national identity. So I will now turn it over to Paul Berry's presentation. While we are, are queuing up Dr. Berry's video, you may have noticed a printed handout on the tables as you walked in. This is a list of works that Dr. Berry wishes to make available uh, for the sake of following along to his slides. If you do not have this handout, if you just raise your hand, we have extra copies, we can bring it to you. Um, we'll be coming down from the, the back with these. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, today's talk uh, 
is uh, like many of my talks uh, dealing with a larger topic that has to be compressed and simplified into a fairly short period of time for uh, meeting the schedule of the symposium. So there'll be many generalizations and uh, sort of overly broad uh, th points, but th the main intent is to look at uh, literati painting, uh, sometimes called Bunjinga or Nanga, and try to better understand some of the aspects of how it is made and how it conveys uh, its uh, meaning. Uh, particularly uh, looking at the aspects of abstraction uh, or abstracted elements that are used to create representative images of an imagined world. It's the idea of moving uh, as a viewer from just looking to actually seeing and meaning that you're really understanding more what you're looking at rather than just seeing something. Uh, we'll start out with a question looking at these two works we see on the screen now. Uh, on the right is the earlier work by Yamamoto Baitsu uh, and on the left uh, the later work from the early uh, 20th century by Tomioka Tessai. Both of them are the same topic of the Lanting Pavilion, an ancient theme done for many centuries in Chinese and Japanese paintings but many different ways. But in this case, they're both members of, or participants rather, of in a uh, romantic, idealized uh, movement uh, uh, called literati painting. Uh, and uh, in this um, movement, the different types of techniques and styles used uh, were less important than the attitude towards the art itself. So in these two works we see di quite different types of brushwork and different types of buildings, but it's the same scene that's being rendered. But these styles were not seen as being in opposition to each other, but as different individualistic interpretations by people who bonded, uh, not because their paintings looked alike, but because they had similar ideas about uh, artistic uh, uh, lifestyle and uh, ways of rendering uh, their imagined worlds. In the next uh, image we look at Kano painting which is using here to uh, uh, typify traditional Japanese painting which was uh, gradually became codified into schools and lineages and in these schools, uh, although paintings changed from uh, generation to generation, uh, there was an intent to keep uh, the topics and the techniques within certain boundaries that were identified as the hallmarks of their tradition. So we see Kano Eitoku from the Momiyama period with the Chinese lions and his adopted son Kano Sanraku with uh, the tigers, part of a tiger and dragon, uh, uh, screen set in the early Edo period, uh, different in style and yet very clearly part of the Kano school. However, and there are Unkoku schools and Tosa schools and many other schools and traditions of Japanese uh, painting, but literati painting was fundamentally different than these. And when we approach that uh, idea of difference, we first need to think about what is a painting and what is representation. And Magritte's famous, this is not a pipe uh, painting uh, that deals with the issue of that representation is actually not the reality of the object that it represents. And uh, in his case, in this painting, he was taking a very literal vision of an ordinary pipe. Uh, but uh, other artists would, like Cezanne here, Man with a Pipe, you have a greatly simplified pipe uh, done with comparatively few strokes and yet clearly uh, referencing a pipe to the viewer. This idea of using abstraction, and this is only a mild form of abstraction, but it could be taken much farther, is uh, part of the movement in painting uh, to uh, use uh, abstraction uh, in terms of uh, 
hinting at or referencing the real world without trying to literally uh, describe it in a conventional sense. For instance, if we look at this, what are we looking at? Uh, it, in a certain sense, at the first glance, it might seem to be uh, totally abstracted, but actually it's a detail of a, a painting um, from the 1920s by Shirkura Jiho. In the, in the center, we have rocks and the branches and the bit of pink around there is representing a flowering red plum tree. So uh, here we have lots of... Uh, abstraction, lots of repeating patterns in the brushwork, and yet it's still meant to be uh, rep representational on some level, but it's using abstracted repeating patterns to create uh, not only representation, but emotions and feelings uh, towards not only the objects being depicted, uh, but towards uh, uh, the reception, the feelings on the part of the viewer. Before going any farther with with abstraction, there's one really important thing, which is when we have the term bunjinga, and the bun means literature, the bunjinga typically has poetry and calligraphy on the painting. We don't have time to talk about that today, but it's important when we talk about abstraction in literati painting, one of the purest forms of it is calligraphy. Uh, on the screen here we have uh, uh, calligraphies by two contemporaneous female uh, artists. On the left, uh, Otagaki Rengetsu, a few lines of her calligraphy from a long calligraphy hand scroll. And on the right, Okahara Seiko, active in Tokyo. She was greatly inspired by the Qing calligrapher Zhengxia and developed her own take on this very bold and dramatic style. Uh, the meaning of these words that we see on the screen is always important, but it's not the meaning of the words that makes it art. The meaning, what makes it art is the actual shapes and the brushwork and the compositions of the abstracted forms that we see. And I'm just, we're not going to deal with this today, but I can't move farther without mentioning that this is a very important part of the sense of abstraction being involved in, in literati painting. This idea of making repeating forms that are sort of abstracted patterns that reference uh, sometimes very carefully, sometimes very vaguely forms in the natural world uh, had gone on for many centuries in Chinese painting and the mid 17th century were codified in the so-called Mustard Seed Garden Manual of Painting or the in Japanese Kaishi Gaden. Uh, here's a couple of pages that show abstracted forms of different sorts of leaf patterns on the right and ways of grouping leaf patterns on the left. Uh, these sorts of things uh, are, this whole book was sh illustrating repetitive patterns that were being used to create paintings uh, in painting in general, but especially in the literati tradition. It's important to note that this book didn't create these things. It was just selecting them out of a long tradition and presenting them not only for artists studying the works to, to learn how to paint, but also viewers who are learning how to appreciate the paintings. And another example here the, on the left, another page from the Kaishien Gaden, uh, it shows how to paint uh, exposed roots of trees with all that angularity uh, that we see in the bottom of the woodblock print on the left. On the right is a painting by Mina Gaokian from around 1800 that shows how those kinds of root approaches actually appeared in real painting. This is not to say that Kian looked at that manual and got this idea because this idea was already percolating through thousands of thousands of paintings that he would have seen. Uh, but it shows this relationship and how these abstracted uh, forms and heavily outlined roots that are open-ended as they touch the earth uh, became uh, a standard pattern for representing trees, as we see also in the circles and the dots for the leaves of the trees on the right. Kaishi Gaden also shows different types of trees and different ranges of trees. Here, here are two different types of pine organizations. Uh, one of my teachers in, in uh, uh, 
traditional painting, Sung Yu He, uh, used to say that when you're painting trees, they should be painted not as outside external objects, but be painted as though they are people in relationship to one another. Uh, here on the right, the, the twisting pines are being described as a relationship between a dragon and a phoenix. On the left, you have uh, a group of pines that could also be look like even like a, a family situation, the parents and the child and so forth. So if you, while you're painting them, you're thinking about the relationship to not as some sort of exterior object, but in sort of personifying the plants and even the rocks and the mountains as something living and organic in relation to each other, it will enliven and greatly deepen the interest of the painting. When we're looking at actual pine, uh, pine uh, uh, paintings here on the right, a uh, painting by Yamamoto Baitsu of a pine, on the left, Hanamura Chokunyu, uh, they're about 60 years apart in time, but if we look at, uh, closely, we can see lots of similarities between the twisting boughs of the pines. But if we look more closely, uh, on the left, the stylization of the needles for the pine uh, and Chokini's work, and on the right for Baitsu, are really entirely different, with the clustering, spreading out, upraised needles uh, that are very carefully organized in Chokini's paintings, and the very uh, scratchy, sketchy, uh, uh, needles uh, that uh, don't even actually meet in a central point uh, and uh, on, on Bias's example. The, these are not just different methods of doing pines, but individuals were expressing their own temperament and their own interests in how they treated pines uh, by adopting different methods of uh, different types of patterns for uh, rendering trees. Pines are one of the most popular types of motifs in the paintings. On the right here, we have Okada Bei Sanjin from the early 19th century with a, um, a narrow uh, gorge-like valley. All those trees that look very different than the ones we looked at are also pine trees. But here's a highly simplified uh, uh, patternization of uh, pines. On the left, another eccentric painter, Oki Mokube of roughly the same time period, we see in the lower left his pine tree that's all gnarled and twisted with kind of exploding um, uh, branches uh, with uh, clusters of very thickly painted uh, uh, pine uh, needles. On the left in these pines, uh, it's another Aoki Mokube painting. On the left, it's very uh, small detail in the actual painting, but you see a really mysterious form of a pine tree that is, uh, there's a few roots you can see at the bottom, but how it grows is very uh, obscure, but creates a very dynamic and fascinating <coughs> uh, form. We can also see the pine needles are being drawn in the traditional way, which is not to start at the center and draw outwards, but start at the end of the tips and draw inwards. And you see the, the outer parts of the needles all thick where the brush first hit uh, the silk and then was drawn inwards. Today, uh, being called a tree hugger is often a critique of environmentalists that are over the top. But the idea of uh, hugging trees was taken quite literally in ancient China. And Totoki Baigai, uh, a friend of Mokube and, and uh, uh, Gyokudo and some of the other artists we were looking at from the early 19th century, here takes a line from Tao Yuan Ming's uh, homecoming poem uh, where a man is embracing a solitary prime. And we look at the pine tree itself and see how it's painted and again different than the others we've seen and entirely different than the one by Mokube and that these are not antagonistic styles but people that were closely bonded together in artistic friendship networks that uh, admired each the differences in each other's approaches. All kinds of uh, abstract forms were being developed to represent things. Uh, honoring rocks has a giant tradition that goes way back for millennia in China. It was also picked up in Japan. In the 19th century, many artists did hand scrolls showing different types of unusual rock forms. Uh, some of them also become sort of animated. The, the large one on the left and the smaller one almost looks like two 
greatly deformed uh, dogs. Uh, 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 but the one we want to really look at is the one on the right, because that kind of abstract form, and this is by Nakanishi Koseki in, in the early Meiji period around the 1870, uh, was picked up by uh, Chokunyu, Tanamura Chokunyu, uh, in this work from the mid-Meiji period, where he has a conventional idea of a tai, uh, tai huskon from China that is famous for having holes, but here they've been uh, rectangularized and abstracted, as well as the, the plant forms that poke in and out of the holes uh, around the stone. The idea of abstracting rocks and, and uh, in all kinds of different matters it runs all the way through literati painting. Well into the 20th century on the left, Kodojin from around the late 1920s has a rocky hillside, but these rocks almost look like melting candles. Uh, it's all uh, kind of curvilinear and, and soft with this sort of repeating uh, curvilinear lines and vertical dots. While on the right, Kai Kozan, who had been a very conventional Nanga painter doing more literalistic interpretations of bird and flowers in the Oita uh, province in Kyushu, moved to Kyoto and in the post-war world when he was in his 80s and 90s moved towards greater and greater abstraction as we see and these sort of monolithic uh, bowlers that seem to be emerging from almost like volcanic ash in a detail of one of his paintings done in 1955 when he was 90 years old. Looking at these, you'd think that maybe these are explosive waves or some sort of tsunami type uh, uh, feature in a landscape, but this is again Aoki Mokube depicting rocky mountains. And yet this kind of uh, dots and uh, washes and uh, uh, rough dry brushwork has such a feeling of movement and energy that it uh, uh, takes the idea of something that we usually think of as very static, like rocks and mountains, and makes it into a volcanic uh, uh, kind of uh, sense of motion and energy. This unusual mountain prominence that goes into sort of a in, impossible arc there on the right, but most interesting is to look at the details of the brushwork, where in the center areas and in here and there you see things that are actually literally sort of nail head strokes, but they look a little more like uh, they're tadpoles in a line uh, forming ridges. And you see them here and there throughout this, uh, this prominence. It's something that Taiga never did. Uh, and this uh, use of a very wet looping outline to outline the major uh, profiles of the landforms uh, in a single line that sort of thins and swells and thins and swells is something that Taiga did but was never so free and playful as we find in Gyokuran's uh, work. Speaking of free and playful, Hosokawa Rinkoku in, in the 1830s and 40s did lots of landscape uh, 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 hand scrolls and hanging scrolls where he used this extreme abstraction for rocks and mountains in a very playful sense of coloration uh, that was quite popular among his literati uh, contemporaries. If you look closely, you also see a little figure riding a cloud off into the distance there, and uh, just to the left of the blue uh, uh, peak. And this sense of patternization, this sense of abstraction, it's not denying the natural world, but trying to uh, uh, invest it uh, with a, a humanized interest through brushwork and uh, abstract uh, generalizations. Looking at uh, uh, different generations of literati paintings treatment of mountains, uh, here on the right we see Uragami Gyokudo from a painting in the exhibition, a little detail of some of the mountain peaks and his use of dots uh, and uh, lightly colored brushwork, uh, that is ink color, uh, in his mountain forms on the right compared with Fukuda Kodojin from the 20th century, from a painting in around the 1920s, 
where you get an even further abstraction and sort of a, a thinning of the color in ink so that you get a transparency and a sense of the dry brushwork and colors and, and a sense in both works of sort of a, a vibrating quality of brushwork and dots. Other, other artists uh, like uh, Okochi Yako that we see here uh, uh, developed very unusual types of abstracted uh, uh, landscapes. This is a detail of his painting uh, of a winter landscape uh, and you see all kinds of uh, amazing uh, uh, abstraction in terms of the brushwork that's representing not only mountains but uh, plants and and distant vistas and so on. When we turn to figure paintings, figure paintings are, are mythological figures and deities as well as regular humans. In Buddhist figures, literati painters are most attracted to the figure of Kanon. Uh, and uh, Chokinu in particular did huge numbers of Kanon paintings of all kinds of different sorts. And here we have uh, uh, a kanon uh, seated on a mat uh, with um, shochikubai, the bamboo, plum, and pine motif there in the uh, uh, bronze pot along with uh, other kinds of literati type implements all around it. And you see the abstracted uh, taihu stone to the left. This kind of uh, contrast between uh, plants and rocks and the human form uh, was something that Chokinu delighted in. Other contemporaries like Yamamoto Chikuun in the Meiji period uh, turned Kanon into kind of a, a literatus figure. Uh, here, a uh, very unusual interpretation of Kanon, reading a book with a, a paper and an ink and a brush uh, all ready to write or perhaps paint on a table uh, next to a vase with uh, white lotuses uh, blooming. And around this we see these dots that we see everywhere in these paintings. Technically they're called moss dots, but as you can see they're often not attached to any particular form, but are kind of floating in space. But this kind of abstract repetitiveness uh, is uh, a common feature of the painting that uh, uh, you find throughout and is used for uh, creating uh, a certain kind of tension in the painting. Human figures are generally small in literati uh, paintings. They're often some of the smallest elements. Sometimes you have to search to find them. Uh, but when you do, you find that they are painted uh, in rather stereotypical fashion uh, without much detail, uh, but are important for sort of injecting uh, identification of the viewer into the landscape that's being painted. On the left, we have Okahara Seiko, again from the Tokyo area, from the, this time from around the 1880s, uh, doing a blue and green style landscape. And you can see this repetitive tree uh, leaf patterns and the ground forms uh, providing a, a vibrant context for these uh, figures on the bridge. On the right, Tomioka Tessai from the early 20th century uh, shows uh, a grouping of uh, the deity of uh, immortality, Jurojin with his deer, and other people uh, going through the mountains collecting the fungus of immortality. If we look at the leaf uh, forms, the tree forms, the rock forms, all of these are not literal uh, depictions of actual rocks, trees, or people, but are highly abstracted and creating a world that is a, uh, a visionary one, an idealized one, uh, uh, a world that is very romanticized, but it's romanticization, it's encapsulating those qualities of life and a relation of uh, human society to nature that was uh, uh, emphasized throughout the literati world. Returning to Origami Gyokudo, and this is a detail of another painting in the show, it's only about uh, one and a half inches wide in the real painting, but here you see a scholar in his studio looking out the window. Uh, behind him, there's a rattan fence that's sort of fencing in the yard. There's a bit of bamboo around them, and you see these, again, this uh, 
uh, scratchy, uh, dry brushwork. It's one of the signal features of his use of repetitious dots, and there's lots of dots here, is the dots are all different from one another. There are some painters when they're doing dots, the dots all resemble one another, but in uh, Gyokudo's uh, approach, virtually every brush stroke is different than the one next to it, which is actually extremely difficult to do, as there's a tendency to get into very standardized patterns. Other literati paintings will focus a bit more on the figures. Matsumura Goshun uh, uh, has multiple versions of the same theme of a fish market. This is one of the most successful of these versions. And if we look at the faces of the people, we see that they're constructed of heavy outlines, similar noses and eyes and so forth, so that there's much alike. And yet when you look at them, there's actually all these different personalities and uh, different sense of excitement, people of different ages, and the one man under the, uh, the f fish on the hook on the left who looks a little bit, why am I here? Why everyone else is uh, so excited about uh, the, the fish being sold. Kameda Bosai, another uh, of the more eccentric uh, figures in the literati movement, uh, in again in the early 19th century has this uh, figure of a strolling scholar with his long sleeve swept beside behind him as he's sort of pensively looking over the edge of a cliff towards a waterfall and this extreme simplification patternization but again the repeating strokes are all very different one from another so that you get this sense of a uh, vibrant variation uh, of the foliage that surrounds uh, this elongated figure uh, that uh, is a, a dreamlike figure, as so many of these are. Moving back uh, to the 1920s, uh, there's a, another interesting uh, painter who uh, Shirakura Jiho that we looked at briefly earlier uh, has this array of figures. It's all based on a Sung Dynasty poem by uh, Wang Anshur, uh, but uh, what's remarkable here is the treatment of the figures and they're very abstracted and simplified. Some of them seem semi-transparent, but they're also surrounded by this uh, dark nijimi of the ink. Uh, spreading, rippling out through the fibers of the paper, creating this very mysterious atmosphere that embraces each figure. And while the clothing is largely the same, as you look at figure to figure, it's easy to get a sense of a different personality and a different attitude to each figure seated around this large rounded stone. Uh, this uh, sense of abstraction and yet intense feeling of human personality being depicted at the same time is one of the achievements of uh, some types of literati painting. Finally, uh, you could look at this painting and you could see these two people standing next to each other and it's like uh, uh, one man pointing and said, just how many dots are there here? And the other person laughing in response. If you see the whole painting, which I encourage you to do, it's in the exhibition, they're actually looking up at a waterfall. But it's also connected to a poem that has uh, by a famous Tang Dynasty Li Bo, uh, poet who, uh, in the poem, there's a line, they ask me, why do you live in these green mountains? And, there is, and I laugh, but do not reply. And so you're getting a sense of the man laughing, you know. He could be laughing about anything, he could be laughing about that very question, uh, but uh, uh, this idea of knowing what you are doing, knowing what your life is, and being asked about it, and being so overflowing with sort of a joyous self-confidence that rather than getting into a detailed explanation, you laugh but do not reply. Chikudin, who, who made this uh, uh, painting, uh, really liked this idea so much that he had 
a seal carved with just the characters laughing but not replying, uh, and that he applied on some of his favorite paintings. Uh, here uh, we see it encapsulating uh, his attitude, uh, not only in this painting, but towards many of the works that he created. When we look at these dots that we've been talking about here, we have saturated with these dots. Notice that they're different ink tonalities. And these tonalities actually separate out into layers. When the painting is being painted, they make uh, dots. Uh, the brush is loaded with one tone of ink. You make a layer of dots. Then you have a different tone of ink and you make a, another scattering of dots. And the final dots are the darker dots. And you can see the darker dots. So those would have been applied last. They give a sense of depth and variation and the final moment of creating the painting. <clears throat> and yet, in looking at it, it wasn't really to show two men surrounded by swirling dots, although literally that's what they are, but what we have really is a, sort of this sense of vibration of the mountain valley they're in, and the, the dots giving this uh, sense of not uh, impressionist type of dots, it's not meant to replicate what we're actually seeing in the impressionist sense, but it's much more a metaphorical uh, sense of uh, depicting energy in plants, animals, rocks, and mountains that is interacting uh, with uh, the people in the painting and the people looking uh, at the works. This is entirely too short of a uh, presentation for a very large topic, but uh, uh, I'd like to just re repeat that these artists were extremely eclectic. They bonded not because they were painting in the same way, they were bonding because of their attitudes towards painting. The friends had radically different styles from one another and they enjoyed that difference. And this was uh, uh, made it not a, a lineage, not a school, but a movement, an idealistic movement. And part of the means of doing this was uh, uh, using abstracted patterns to create representations of not the actual world, but of an imaginary world that was there, uh, that expressed the ideals that they believed in, in terms of lifestyle, poetry, and, and uh, attitudes towards life and nature. Thank you very much. I thought, although this is very, I'm doing this with trepidation, um, if people had some question about Paul Berry's talk, um, uh, Jeannie and I have read his entire essay and all of his contributions, uh, um, all of his uh, entries to the catalog, and Michio knows his work intimately. I wondered if there were questions about that, and there's an outside chance that we may be able to tell you what Paul might say. <laughs> um, just, um, it, it might be a, a silly enterprise, but if there, it was such, um, he understands this phenomenon, literati painting, um, with such a, a profoundness that's truly rare, and it was so wonderful. Um, um, he, he wasn't able to travel himself. I'm so, I'm blown away by the technical facility of him being able to create a video like that. Um, but I thought you might have some questions to ask of the Barry phenomenon. <laughs> is there anything that we might be able to help you with? Yes, I was wondering, is there an equivalent in, uh, in Japanese uh, art circles of the mustard seed garden manual? Was there ever a manual produced and distributed amongst Japanese that highlighted their own, you know, unique methods? Um, Jeannie? Um, there are, actually there were versions of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual that were, of course, um, reproduced in Japan. Um, Kaishian Gaden is the Japanese name for the Mustard Seed Garden Manual, not the Chinese name. Um, these were the Kawanami editions made in Kyoto in the 1740s. Um, and then they continued to um, uh, redo versions of this that were, that were take on it. Oka Shunboku does a version that clearly recalls 
Um, he's clearly looking at uh, Kaishin Garden. Um, he titles it something different and, and adds his own designs as well, but um, absolutely this, this happened. And then this emerges into this whole genre of gafu, or painting albums, um, many of which are uh, devoted to the work of a single artist, but often circles or putting that particular artist's uh, work in connection with a larger sort of Japanese painting tradition. Who is Shiseki? So Shiseki is one of these artists. Um, uh, Tachibana school artists are also commonly doing this. Kano school artists eventually begin to do this. Ukiyo-e artists as well. Um, Hanabusa school. So it's, it gets all over the place very, very quickly. Why did they call it literati painting? Is that a reference to the Chinese literati painting? Yes. And why? Because it doesn't seem to have much relation. <laughs> much relation to what? To the Chinese literati painting. Oh, we need to suggest a couple of books, Marilyn. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think the relationship is, is quite profound. Um, uh, one of the things that we find is that the artists who self-select to be in these circles, um, maybe primarily in Kyoto or in Kansai, and then later it spreads geographically and, and uh, uh, comes up to Edo as well. Um, I think in their own minds, these are men who, um, many of them are uh, samurai class who have become what all samurai become in the Edo period, bureaucrats. Um, and so they are trained from childhood in their domain schools in Confucian classics. Confucianism was the um, orthodox philosophy of the Tokugawa government. Um, so they are, um, just as Zen monasteries in the Muromachi period had been universities of Chinese studies, domain schools are where you read Confucian classics, you read Chinese history, um, um, these people all knew their Chinese history probably better than they knew Heian period history. Um, and you, they read Chinese poetry. And so um, they became quite aware of literati painting or nanga, Southern School of Painting, as a phenomenon in China. Um, and many, many of the works are specifically inspired by particular Chinese poems. Um, Sadako mentioned the uh, hand scroll by Ike no Taiga, who's one of the very early masters in this. It's, it's an extraordinary painting because it's very early in his career, 1749, 50, am I remembering correctly? Um, but he quotes uh, at length a Chinese poem uh, at the end of that, written in beautiful calligraphy, by the way, um, that clearly inspires the subject of that. So they are living and breathing Chinese texts. Um, the best way I can think to come up with a analogy for this would be the way that um, monastics in medieval Europe lived and breathed in Latin. Um, so they, they're thinking in Latin. These men wrote their death poems in Chinese. So, so the, the Chinese literary tradition um, and the same literary tradition that would have inspired their counterparts in China inspired their work. And one of the things that's often said about literati painting in Japan, it's often spoken of in terms of generations. You sort of have uh, soft entry with Gion Nankai, Minagawa Kien, Anyway, three guys. Um, and uh, uh, Kofuyu, maybe? And at any rate, people who um, self-identify as sinologists. And they, um, Sadako mentioned artists who sort of took up the study of Chinese antiquarianism. They start seal carving. Um, they essentially fashion themselves as sinophile literati. Um, and then sort of the first full blossom generation is Ikino Taiga and Yose Buson. And, in their early careers, their knowledge of Chinese literati painting, which they s sort of set up as a model, um, is uh, material that's known to them primarily through imported, port imported printed books, um, and a little less, but a little bit of theory. Um, 
And one of the things that Paul Berry points out in his essay for the catalog, so this is good, I can talk about his work, is um, that there's a certain accept degree to which anything that's Chinese is going to be of interest to them. So we see uh, Japanese artists eagerly uh, flocking to Nagasaki when a Chinese ha merchant comes in who happens to paint. And even if that person is painting in a style that Orthodox Chinese literati wouldn't consider literati, the Japanese are not sort of making a clear distinction because they haven't been schooled in the sort of Chinese categories. Um, Anyway, that's kind of the uh, second half of the 18th century. And by the time we get to the early 19th century, Yamamoto Baitsu, who does the wonderful um, Orchid Pavilion gathering, the work that we have blown up in the um, sculpture court. Um, and uh, anyway, by the time we get to his generation, now there are, in Japan, collectors who have, have put together uh, interesting collections of honest to God, Chinese literati paintings. So now they can look at real Chinese paintings in this school, um, and their knowledge then, their sense of brushwork, their sense of color harmonies um, becomes much more refined. Um, and one might also say, um, it, it is certain more refined, kind of tidier, perhaps, depending on the artist, not true of, not true of all of them. Um, but I think that one of the points that Paul makes in his essay is that uh, because Japanese artists were you know, at a distance from the Chinese models, they, they, it ends up being a tradition um, that is, is more varied and more free than the way that it progresses in China. But it does evolve over time. But it's, um, they do see themselves, I mean, they are scholars. Um, many of these guys, Rai Sanyo, Tanamura Chikudan, were scholars who wrote histories. Rai Sanyo wrote one of the most influential early histories of Japan. Tanamaru Chikuden wrote a history of his own domain. Um, they saw themselves as literatuses, a literati lati for the plural, and it, it was very much core to their identity. Michio, would you want to? Do I have a question? No, yes. Uh, I somewhere read that uh, the Japanese were bringing in paintings by Lan Ying fairly early on. Is there any truth to that? I, I, or, or more, are there any Chinese paintings that have, can be proven to, literati type, been proven to have been brought in in the 17th century? Tamaki-san, Benika. Hello, I, I don't really know like in the 17th century per se, but by the, um, uh, let's say, probably early, 19th century, 1820s or something, definitely Nakabayashi Chikuto was actually making a direct copy uh, of Lain's painting. But I think um, it goes back earlier than that. And then I think that the painting of Lantim Orchid Pavilion Gathering, that was probably brought to Japan much or slightly earlier. Um, we have lots of people, scholars here, gathered from all over the country. Does anybody else have some information to add to that particular point about dates of importation of paintings? Um, the only thing that, that I mean, uh, the earliest recollection that I have, but this is because I, don't keep, I haven't kept up in this literature, I remember um, Jim Cahill talking about um, Yosef Busson encountering imported Chinese paintings on a visit to Sanuki um, in 1766. And Jim quite compellingly documents a change in his style when he begins to see high caliber Chinese paintings of the literati school, whereas the, as opposed to some of other Nagasaki school things that he had seen before.